All right, all right. Thanks for clicking on the video. My name is Cam Buckner, and this is the Dixie Cryptid Podcast. And I'm so glad you joined us. It's a happy place to come and listen to good stories, and I appreciate you clicking on the video. I've got four, let's see, one, two, three, four stories in this podcast. I've got three that I did. They're Bigfoot encounters. And we have one that's a dogman story. It's a fictional story that was written by my great friend, Neoma Finn. And I wanted to give you a little taste. If you guys haven't checked out the What If It's True podcast, these are the kind of things we do at the What If It's True podcast. I'll put a link in the description for that channel if you haven't become aware of it. We do a lot of fun stuff over there. Ghost, dog man, fiction. Just that's the fun channel. That's where we go and do really fun stuff. And then after the four stories, uh, we this is my first podcast after the Smoky Mountain Bigfoot Conference. We were there Saturday and just had a great time. We had a great time meeting so many people. I was just blown away by how nice everyone was. So after the story's in, I'm going to talk about that a little bit if you want to hang around and listen to it. And don't forget our Yeti brothers at Yeti Bars Soaps. They make a great product, great soaps. We had 50 bars. I thought I'd take 50 bars to the conference for people to buy and sample and we sold all 50 in two hours people picked it up and kind of checked out the scents the different smells of each soap and they bought them up like crazy yeti bars has a one dollar off each bar sale going on right now so go to yetibars.net or yeti bars on facebook and check those guys out and order some soap it's cheap right now And if you use the code DC10, when you check out, you get another 10% off. So go check those guys out at yetibars.net and yetibars on Facebook. All right, let's get into this video. All right, here we go. This first story is uh, from a woman who doesn't want her name revealed. No big deal. No big deal. Still a great story. Here's what she writes. This story happened somewhere in Mexico in the 1970s. It was told to me by my brother-in-law. I've never spoken with his friend about it, but as crazy as it is, I believe it's true. Since he wouldn't like it if I revealed his name, I would prefer that we all remain anonymous. My brother-in-law and his best friend were down in Mexico deer hunting. His friend hired some guides because they didn't know the area. In the 1970s, the drug cartel was all over the place, so they were warned if they had to hide to do exactly as they were told. Understandably, they were more than just a little nervous. They arrived where they planned to camp near the opening of the cave. They had their pack animals and supplies, and they were heavily armed both for hunting and for protection. The next morning, when they went out to hunt, my brother-in-law was struggling to deal with his fear of being arrested in Mexico. So when the guides found them places to set up, he insisted that he be close to his friend. That first day, they hunted the whole day and saw a couple of deer. His friend told him to calm down, that it was only the first day. Calming down was not easy for them because the guides did not come back to get them. They had some beef jerky and some water with them, and they set up the best camp that they could, but it was a long night. The next morning, before daylight, one of the guides found them and told them that the other guides had left with the animals. He didn't know if they'd be coming back. At daybreak, the three headed out to try to find their way to the vehicles. At some point, my brother-in-law's friend was overcome by his fear and he panicked. He ran off. My brother-in-law tried, but there was no stopping him. Now it was just my brother-in-law and one guide. They managed to find where they'd left the vehicles, but my brother-in-law couldn't leave without his friend. The guide went back to look for him, leaving my brother-in-law in the vehicle to wait. They were parked close to the border, so that was the only small comfort. My brother-in-law waited for the rest of the day. The sun set, and he fell asleep while he was waiting. 
When he woke up, he found himself surrounded by Mexican nationals, none of whom spoke English. My brother-in-law didn't speak Spanish, but somehow they managed to convey to him that he needed to leave or he would die. So he left. With no other choice, my brother-in-law crossed the border and confessed everything to the border patrol. They were not happy with him, but at least now there would be others looking for his friend. My brother-in-law was sent to a town to wait for the news of his friend. After three days, the border patrol still hadn't found him, so they sent my brother-in-law home and said they'd send news if they found him there. However, they warned him that they didn't expect to find his friend alive at this point. My brother-in-law returned to his Texas town to face his friend's wife with the news. For two weeks, he did his best to keep her calm and try to prevent her from panicking. And then the news came. His friend was found by the highway patrol, lying on a highway in Texas, and he was alive. My brother-in-law went to see him in the hospital, but his friend wouldn't speak. He was dazed and confused. Even after they got him home, he wasn't talking. Physically, he was fine. He was just in a deep state of shock. Weeks went by with my brother-in-law making regular visits, and still he wouldn't speak. Eventually, he began to come around, and finally, he was able to tell this story. In his panic, he had gotten lost. He went down to the river bottom to hide among the boulders at the base of the cliffs. He was sure he was being hunted by the cartel and that death was imminent. He happened on a cave and he went inside to hide. And there, a big hairy man found him. This creature, for the lack of a better word, brought him raw meat and berries to eat. He still had some jerky, so he passed on the meat. There was a female who brought him water as well, and it was days before he felt strong enough to leave them. When the time came, they were at the mouth of the cave, and he did his best to communicate goodbye to them. Once he was able to make them understand that he had to go, the female took him to the river where he filled his water pouch. Again, he said goodbye, and she didn't try to stop him. He stuck to the riverbanks, knowing he'd have to hide every now and then to keep from being caught by the cartel. My brother-in-law said it was weeks before he could get the whole story out of him. No one talks about the time his friend got lost trying to hunt deer in Mexico. And When my brother-in-law's friend first started telling his story, he'd left out the part of the Bigfoot. It was only when he had gone to a deer lease in South Texas that his friend finally confessed the whole story. Even then, my brother-in-law accused him of lying. This guy has made a full recovery now, but it was years before he could even go hunting again. I've never spoken with him directly to confirm or deny any of these details. This is only how my brother-in-law told the story, and I hope you can use it. Well, heck yeah, we can use it. Man, that's like the, I want to say her name because I know her. She comments a lot and she sends me messages on Facebook a lot and I'm not able to respond to to all of them. But when she hears the story, she's going to know. And I actually haven't heard from her in a while. I hope she's doing okay. But I'm just rambling on. But this is a great story. It's like a, man, you can make a, you can make a movie out of this. This is unreal. And it's given me an idea for a, maybe a little fictional tale kind of tailored around this guy's event. That would be fascinating. And it also kind of reminds me of Bobby Clark's White Mountain Bigfoot that I have read all, both of his books. He's got a new one out. By the way, it's a good time to plug the book. Bobby Clark has a series of three books. It's the White Mountain Bigfoot series. I actually narrated the first two on audible they're out on audible right now and itunes i think they're on itunes uh, you can find them you can go to my website and i've got a section for the audio books that i've done you can go in there i've also got six more i'm under contract to do and i'm about to finish up on a couple that i'm doing for jack lafountain and then da roberts has asked me to do three three of his uh 
code wild hunt books and i'm real excited about that but you know get me started talking and i never shut up but i just thought i'd tell you all about that but to the woman who sent this you know who you are this was a great story i'm so glad you remembered it and i'm i'm really super glad you shared it with us to let us hear it so thank you very much ma'am the rescue the jogger ran into the road just a few yards in front of her car If she'd been on the highway, she'd have never been able to stop in time. Fortunately, she wasn't traveling very fast on the gravel and managed to avoid him. A quick glance across the field from whence he came revealed the source of his panic. A massive, dog-like creature was running straight for them. She recognized it immediately. The man opened the passenger door and was sliding into the seat next to her even as she was saying get in. Gravel rooster-tailed from her rear tires as the creature hit the road. A long, ear-shattering screech echoed through the car as the thing's claws left four deep trails down the back quarter panel. It's following us, she said, looking in a rearview mirror. Reaching down, she pulled an air horn from under her seat, rolled down her window, stuck it out, and squeezed the trigger. Ugh! The jogger moaned at the sound. Sorry, she muttered. It's just that they hate loud noises. Taking advantage of her captive audience, and the fact that he had to be a believer, she went on. I suggest if you plan on continuing to jog, you get yourself one of these and take it with you. And get a flashlight, too. It has to be a bright one, at least 1,500 lumens. They hate bright light as much as they hate loud noises. Using them could give you the chance you need to get away. She checked the rearview mirror again inside. It looks like he's gone, she said reassuringly. Another thing, though, she thought to add. They can disguise themselves as humans. She didn't bother to look at her passenger when she said that. She knew she sounded crazy. But when he said nothing, she continued. Look, as crazy as that sounds, these things are smart. I've seen them dressed in human clothing before. Sometimes if you don't look directly at them, or if you only get a glimpse, they actually look like people. I swear you could walk right past one on the street and, maybe only for a minute or two, they look completely human. As she spoke, she saw it out of the corner of her eye. It was too late, but she flinched anyway as the long, hair-covered arm reached across her face, grabbed her head by the other side, and quickly snapped her neck. The car careened out of control, spun, rolled, landed on its side, and slid for several yards along the ditch before coming to rest on its roof. The creature, in jogger's apparel, quickly kicked out the front windshield and Dragging the body behind it, ran into the field where the other one was waiting. Somewhere off in the woods, they had their meal, reveling in a feeling of intense satisfaction at the knowledge that this woman would never sound one of those horns or shine one of her flashlights at them again. Yeah, you can laugh at my story if you want, but I've been a deputy in this county for 30 years, and all the craziest calls I ever took were at that woman's house in the last five. She wasn't from around here. She was one of those city people looking for an escape. Thought she'd found it, too. Just her and her dogs. A lazy old fat cat that spent all its time sitting in her front living room window and a dozen or so chickens. But things started happening, and I started getting called out there pretty regular. The last time I was there, she told me she'd figured out how to keep them away. And when we found her car out there in the gravel road, the air horn was laying in the ditch by it and her flashlight was still sitting between the seats. Her front window was broken out. We never did find the body, but the drag marks clearly indicated someone, or something, had taken her. So this is what I think happened. Maybe I'm wrong. But maybe I'm right. The wife and I put a bid on her farmhouse just the other day. It's prime property, and worth a lot more than it's being sold for. I couldn't pass up the opportunity. That's why I'm on my way to the store right now to get myself an air horn and a good bright flashlight. 1,500 lumens are better, I think she told me. Here's an email from Ray. And Ray is writing, he's he's writing in about some anecdotal evidence that I think is fascinating. I hope you do too. So Ray writes, I'm from Central Texas, and though I have somehow always believed in Bigfoot, I've never had any experiences here that I was aware of. However, as I get older, I think there were times when I may have had experiences and didn't realize it. 
I want to share with you what happened north of Nashville a few years ago when I was working there. I went up one summer for a big job and was fortunate to have friends from my hometown who lived about 30 miles from where I was working. They live on a big hill way out in the country near the Kentucky border. The driveway leading to their house ran along the creek that ran through the holler with a ridge line on both sides. It was absolutely beautiful, surrounded by lush green trees and the sight and sound of the babbling creek over its rocky bed. I often went for walks or a jog in the evenings when I wasn't too tired. I had done so many times. When one evening, about an hour before sunset, as I was walking on the far ridge, I heard a whoop. I thought I was hearing things, and shortly after that, on the hillside next to me, only a few hundred yards away, I heard a clear and loud tree knock. I really started to think now, was I hearing things? Was it some locals or meth heads messing with me? I kept walking, my friend's dog at my side, as I tried to reason out what I had heard. I'd gone another hundred yards when I heard another whoop. What the hell, I thought and it was followed shortly by another wood knock, this time on the far hill. The dog had disappeared, so much for man's best friend. I decided then it was time to head back. I heard a few more knocks and whoops before I got back to the house, but none of them were closer than the others. I don't know if they knew I was there. I don't think so. It was an extremely secluded, rough terrain covered in thick woods. The one thing I'm absolutely certain of is that it was not people I was hearing. I was staying in my RV at my friend's place. From that night forward, I always used my spotlight to check before I went outside. I never saw anything, but I did occasionally feel like something was watching me or was close by. I know this wasn't an actual sighting, but it was enough to change me from being just a believer to a knower. Ray... Look, I've said this, and look, I'm no authority on this. I don't know, but I do know this. You said you felt like that something was watching you. You didn't, you, and, and I think in a way you're saying you didn't feel like you were alone, alone when you should have been alone. There shouldn't have been anything around you. I always kind of encourage people to, you know, kind of go with your sixth sense there, that feeling that you get, you know, when something is around is kind of more times than not. I, I kind of, it's like, I, I read a thing one time that said, if you have a hunch about something like, I, this doesn't apply to Bigfoot at all, but like, I just kind of stumbled on this article. I think I was actually in a dentist office and I was reading this article. You know how you just pick up a magazine, you just read whatever's there. It was a women's magazine, of course, and I was reading through it and it was uh, advice to women. And it said, if you If you think your spouse is being unfaithful to you, you're probably right. Now, I don't know that I agree with that at all, at all. I mean, I think you need just a little bit of evidence. I mean, you know, I could go through all the things that I don't know much about any of that. But but the point is, is like you have a hunch. There are little things that, that clue you in that something is there. And most of us. We try to get back to normal just as fast as we can. If there's something strange going on, we try to get back to normal as quickly as we can. And in these situations, what you'll do is you'll kind of brush it off. Well, that was a, maybe that was a tree knock, but maybe it was just a piece of wood falling out of a tree and it hit another tree. You know, you'll explain it away. But if you get that feeling, you're probably right. Now, should you run and hide and be terribly scared and all that stuff? Probably not. But trust your instincts, you know, and I think you did on this one. I didn't mean to ramble on so long about this, but it was kind of interesting to me because I think these anecdotal, weird kind of events, sounds and noises and smells and feelings that people have, I think there's merit to those. And I love hearing these, and I really appreciate the man sending this. This was great. I really, really appreciate it, Ray. All right, let's move on to one more. This is an email I received from a woman named Ann, and this is, uh, I don't know if it's the way she wrote it or the content of the story, but it has uh, moved its way up to like my top five stories that I've ever done that I 
that have amused me so much that I don't think I'll ever forget it. That last story with the with the cartel chasing the guy was just as good, but this one is fantastic. So, and it's kind of funny. The way she wrote it is great, so sit back and enjoy it. Here's what she writes. My grandfather was born in 1900. It was a sad day in 1975 when the underlying issues that had plagued him his entire life finally caught up with him and he passed away. He was truly a good man. Before he died, he told me a story about when he and a friend of his were nine years old. As little boys were inclined to do back then, they had taken up a game of cowboys and Indians out behind a field. Armed with homemade slingshots, they were taking pot shots at just about anything they could draw a bead on. There was a daisy. Pop! Now it was a dead daisy. Oh, look at that milkweed. Bang! Splattered milk everywhere. They carried on in this fashion, shooting and conquering everything in sight. They even took aim at a rock, and it just ricocheted, but they congratulated themselves on the fine effort. And then my grandfather saw the bushy tail of a squirrel sticking out from behind a tree. With eyes filled with the glint of mischief only a nine-year-old can muster, he loaded his trusty slingshot and pow! He nailed that pesky squirrel right in the backside. But it wasn't a squirrel. Roar, cried the squirrel with a deafening thunder as it stood up to over eight feet tall and stepped from behind the tree. What was worse is right next to the giant two-legged squirrel was an identical giant two-legged squirrel who looked just as angry. It's not a squirrel! It's not a squirrel! stammered my grandfather's friend as the boy slowly began to back away. Run! screamed my grandfather, and they both turned, grabbed hold of the wind, and scattered. My grandfather chose a route that took him straight to an old rickety two-seater outhouse that he knew was on the property. He got inside and did his best to bolt the door before the creatures caught up with him and began to shake and rock the little building with all their might. Inside, my grandfather held on to the two holes as dirt and debris of the ages rained down on his head. He could smell the pit directly below him, but his fear of the two beings trying to tear down his only shelter outweighed his disgust. He rattled and bounced around, losing and then regaining his grasp, feeling like every joint in his body was being jarred loose until, with an awful moaning crack, the little house began to split apart. The plank of wood with the two holes gave way first, cracking and splitting before falling into the pit below, taking my grandfather right with it. He tumbled eight feet into that hole, landing with a great kerplop into the muck below. Darkness surrounded him as he sat quietly listening to the two Bigfoot above. Suddenly he heard a muffled call from somewhere in the woods, and then there was silence. It felt like an eternity before he began his long climb back to the world. He grabbed at the roots and kicked his feet into the cold earth to make footholds until he was finally standing back on the surface, surrounded by the splintered pile that was once an old outhouse. And to his great relief, the ape boys were gone. That was the day that my grandfather, God rest his soul, (laughs) learned a big lesson on respect for others in the woods. I still have his smelly slingshot. (laughs) Oh, I did pretty good. I got through that without cracking up, but it was, it was coming up. I could feel it coming up and I just kept reading. I kept, kept reading. And that was such a good story. And I actually believe it. I, I don't know why there's just something about this story that makes me believe it. 75 year old man was telling his granddaughter this story way before Bigfoot was a big thing. And I think that's probably the the thing that makes me believe this story. But wasn't that great? Did y'all love that story, man? I did too. And thank you so much for sending this. I apologize it took so long to get to it, but I'm going to get to all of them. Everybody be patient. I'm going to get to all of them. 
I just want to thank her for sending it because it was wonderful. What a great writer you are, and thank you for that. Okay, the Smoky Mountain Bigfoot Conference. I have never in my life gone to a Bigfoot conference, and I really never had any interest in going to one, to be candid with you. I, I just, I don't know. I just, I'm not big on going to conferences and conventions and things like that. But my good friend Nance over at Buckeye Bigfoot, she called me about, I mean, it's probably a year ago, maybe nine months ago. She goes, why don't we go do the Gatlinburg Smoky Mountain Bigfoot Conference? And I'm like, ah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that's for me. And she goes, come on, let's share a booth and let's go. And she talked me into it. And I'm so glad she did because we went and had an unbelievable time. I didn't get to see much of the whole event. I was kind of hanging around our booth and just talking to people, but it was unreal. But I was really blown away at how nice everyone was. I mean, there's no way I'm adequately going to explain it here in this podcast, but I may talk about this for about 10 minutes because I met so many nice people. That's the reason I did it, because I wanted to meet, I wanted to see your face. I wanted to meet the people who actually listen to this silly podcast because you know, if you put a face, shake a man's hand or hug a woman's neck, it just, you just finish off the connection. And so that's why I went. There were people there from Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, met a woman from Boston, or there was two women there from Boston, Massachusetts. There were several couples there or people there from Wisconsin. Heck, after the conference was over, we went across the street and ate barbecue, and we got to meet a really nice family from Wisconsin. Matter of fact, the uh, patriarch of the family was uh, uh, a a Harley Davidson employee at their plant up in Wisconsin. It was cool to meet him. People there from Pennsylvania, Texas. I met a guy who was originally from the Pacific Northwest. He had moved down into the southern region of the United States. I said, man, when are you going back? He said, I ain't never going back. I love it down here. And it was great to meet him. I met so many people that were just good, such good, nice people that it just blew me away. There were drywall hangers, iron workers, factory workers. I told you about the Harley Davidson plant guy, truck drivers. I met a chemist. He's a scientist, and he's real interested in Bigfoot. He and I had a great discussion, and we were kind of challenging each other on what it's going to take for Bigfoot to become a scientifically recognized species. And he would make a point. I would challenge that, and I would make a point, and he would challenge me. We had a great discussion. It's good to talk to people and that, that aren't just hell-bent on bringing you over to their side of what they think Bigfoot is. We just talked about all the possibilities, and it was so cool. A lot of people were there for a short vacation, a long vacation. I met one guy who said, uh, my wife and family aren't into Bigfoot, but she came here with me for our anniversary, and I thought that was awesome. She did something nice for him, and uh, so he was he was there and having a great time. And everybody I talked to was just really enjoying the whole event. I think they sold twenty five hundred tickets. I'm guessing I'm guessing there were twenty five hundred people there, maybe a little less. I'm sure some people had things come up, couldn't show up. It was just a great event. It was a fun time. So I really kind of met our people. I mean, if all of you guys who are listening would have been there, you would know what I'm talking about. They're just our people. They're just regular people, and they have an interest, and they have a fun time learning about Bigfoot and all that. It's such a mystery to them, and it's a a great topic, and they love the stories, and they were so nice to Nance and I. Neoma Finn was there. I got to, you know, Neoma Finn and I have been working together for six or eight months. I've never seen her in person. We just work remotely and over the phone and through the internet. But I got to meet her and her husband. And of course, I got to meet Nance and her husband, Dean, for the first time. I've talked to her for a couple of years. And it was so good to, to meet them and, and have dinner with them and just talk like friends. You know, it was great. So many people brought me a gift, and I'm really, I really have a hard time accepting gifts. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a pride thing, but the thing is, I don't want y'all spending a penny on me. Y'all, everybody works hard for their money, and they, they, people don't have time. People made me things and brought them, and I would list them all, but there was uh, probably a dozen things that people gave us. Uh, Leanne, my friend from, uh, I think she lives in DeSoto County, Mississippi, just just right down the road here. They brought me this really cool thing, and there was a, 
<laughs> a little thing that made Bigfoot sounds. I don't have it with me right now. She wanted me to do it on a podcast, but Leanne, I don't have it with me right now. And then just just such thoughtful and nice little gifts and mementos, and they're all going to be hanging in my office. And I really appreciate everybody. Let's see, what else can I tell you? Oh, one of the people I met was, you know, a year or two ago, I did some stories by kids, some fictional stories by kids. Uh, I just kind of put it out there. I said, if any of you young people want to write, want to hear your story on a podcast, send it in. The first little girl who sent me a story, her name was Sarah. She was there and I got to meet her and all her brothers and sisters and her father. And it just encouraged, she was so happy. It's been, it's been a couple of years since I did that. She's grown a couple of years and she's still writing. And uh, she was telling me that uh, what a thrill it was to hear her story on the podcast. And man, that that's why I do it. That's why I was doing that. But there were there were a bunch of crabby old Bigfoot people saying, well, we don't come here and listen to fake news. We're, if you think li- fiction by a kid is fake news, you're an illiterate idiot. I'm just telling you, you're an illiterate idiot. You couldn't write a story if you had a sharp pencil in your hand and a clean piece of paper. But these kids can outright you two to one. We don't come here and listen to no fake Bigfoot stories. We want the real thing. So I gave these kids a chance to write. I'm going to start doing it again. I'm going to start doing it again because I'm hoping we run all the crabby people off. I thought I'm hoping we have. But this Bigfoot conference was one of the most fun things I've ever done. And everyone, everyone was so nice to me. You, you uh, There's no way to describe how nice every single person I met was. And I love you all, and I appreciate you coming and letting me meet you and you being so nice to me. It was just a great experience. I had people uh, tell me that, for for example, a year ago, this one guy told me I was going through a hard time. He said I was going through a hard time in my life, and it was so good to come over to a nice, relaxing, happy environment and just relax and listen to a good story. You know, that's not my mission. That's not my goal. I wasn't ever thinking that would happen, nor did I try to make that happen. But I, uh, he told me that, and I was doing everything I could to keep from uh, losing it in front of him. I was so moved by what he was telling me, and he was sincere. I could see it in his eyes. And, you know, I've gotten letters from people who said, you know, I went through drug treatment, or I went through this, or I had my husband passed away, or I wound up alone or, and they said, you know, your stories and your podcast really relaxed me through this. And, you know, that's where I go when things are going crazy in my life. I go to a book because stories are the one thing that bring us all together. And so the people who, this guy who told me that and the other people who have sent me letters, you're so nice to let me know. And I don't feel like I'm doing anything special. I really don't. I'm just narrating your Bigfoot stories and your cryptid stories. And on What If It's True, we're doing uh, other stories, dogmen and ghosts and things like that. So I don't feel like I'm doing anything special. It's just kind of, it's really kind of silly in my mind, but I just love doing it. I just love doing it. Uh, As long as I can, I'm going to keep doing it. But the people who uh, told me those things, thank you for letting me know. I would never assume that I'm helping anyone, but it's just nice to know that people can listen to this and have fun and be relaxed. And that was the whole point of doing this channel is to give everybody a fun place to come and listen to some uh, sometimes scary, sometimes happy, sometimes funny stories. And that's all I ever wanted to do is just tell a story. And, and, and it's happening. And I can't believe it. And everyone that came up to talk to me reaffirmed that and confirmed it and made me feel so welcome and so included in their life. So thank you for including me. Thank you for being so encouraging. Everyone who, who came to talk to me, <laughs> I have to say this, speaking of gifts, One guy walked by and he just slipped a hundred dollar bill in my hand and it was in my hand before I realized what he was doing. I thought maybe he was giving me his card or his phone number or something like that or his email address. And I looked down as a hundred dollar bill and I, and I grabbed his arm. I said, Hey, get back here. I don't, I can't take this hundred dollar bill. He said, no, no, I want you to have it, man. You've given me so much enjoyment. 
this is just a little thing, and I'd like to, to, to give you this money. And I was arguing with him. I was saying, no, man, I can't take it. I've got a job. I don't, I don't need your money. You, you go buy your wife something with this money. And there was a preacher behind me, and he said, he's, he tapped me on the shoulder, and he says, don't you give that money back. And I'm like, man, I, I don't want this money. He said, don't you dare rob him of the joy of being a blessing to you. And I still wanted to give it back, but I listened to the man and I knew what he was talking about. So I kept the hundred dollars. It's the first time I can ever remember ever doing that. And so I wanted to let the man know you buy, you bought myself and other people that I was with that night dinner. No, it was breakfast the next morning. We bought breakfast the next morning. You fed about six people. The waitress got a good tip. And it was a blessing to us. And what a nice guy and what a generous guy to do that. So, and I'm sorry, there were so many other people that said so many great things. And I apologize if I'm not including you in this, but uh, there were a lot of people there. And uh, I, it's hard to remember everybody's name. And, and But I'm just telling you the things that stood out. So uh, we're 13 minutes into this. I, I'll shut up about it. But I'm so giddy about the whole thing. I've come back just absolutely raring to go. Uh, maybe you can tell. Maybe not. I don't know. But it's uh, I'm real excited. And they... Uh, other people were wanting to know, were we coming back next year? I think so. I think we'll be back next year. Uh, Nance and I have decided to get our own booths. And so hopefully we'll be right next to each other. So all the weird and wonderful people that listen to our stuff will kind of be congregated in one section. And uh, y'all can all come. We can all hang out together at the conference again. And there's some other ones. I found one in Texas, and I think there's one in Florida and we're looking at those. I don't I don't know if I'm into all that, but I had so much fun. It's kind of like going down a roller coaster, man. It's so fun. You want to do it again and again and again. And that's how much fun I had at this thing. Neoma had a good time. She wanted me to tell you guys how nice you were and how thankful she is for the people that watch this channel. And Nance was just clobbered with love and 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 your your compliments and she does such a great job at buckeye bigfoot and i'm so glad she's my friend and neoma too uh, neoma thanks for helping with this and and i'm about caught up with work and we're going to start cranking out more podcasts i know i've been pretty much absent for the last 45 days or so but i'm in good shape we're cranking out podcasts the last announcement i have to make it's friday night at seven o'clock we're going to premiere the next steve lilly installment Steve Lilly, and I'm just going to title it number seven. So people who have kept up with the Steve Lilly episodes, there are six of them. The first five are in one video. It's about a two and a half hour podcast. So just find it, Steve Lilly one through five. And then we have another one that's a Steve Lilly number six. Go find that, listen to it, and then you're caught up and you'll be ready for Friday night at seven o'clock for the premiere. We're going to do it as a premiere on YouTube steve lily number seven it's gonna be a long podcast and it's a good one it's all oh, they steve lily and lewis and hook they have tangled up with a bigfoot they cannot figure out and how they well, I, i'm not even gonna tell you if they get him i'm not even gonna i'm not gonna be as I'm, I'm not gonna be a spoiler i'm just some weird stuff happens in the story steve lily though is at the top of his game so is Lewis. So is Hook. I hope you guys enjoy it. Okay, I'm going to shut up. 16 minutes. We're going to end this podcast. I really appreciate everyone who was so nice to me at the conference. I love you all. We're a little crazy, wonderful, weird subculture of the Bigfoot genre. Where everybody that I talk to is the kind of people I want watching this, this channel, these videos, and listening to these podcasts. They're just good people. They're my people, and I love you, and I appreciate you, and I hope to see you again on the next podcast. All right, I'm going to shut up.